Hey, Compass Church family, great to be here with you tonight. My name is Daryl. I serve as the executive pastor here at Compass, and pleased to introduce you to my friend David Spencer. Welcome. Glad to be here. Yeah, uh, David, you're the senior pastor of The Church of Chicago. That's right. The Church of Chicago. Yes. Uh, <laughs> also uh, an evangelical free church. We're in the same denomination and almost on the same street. You are like due east of the Compass Church uh, in Oak Lawn, That's right, right by Chicago. That's yeah. correct. Fantastic. And also a professional musician. I think that'll come up later in our conversation. But how many different instruments do you play, David? Well, uh, I play all the instruments uh, in my music education uh, learning. I was planning on being a, a music teacher. And in fact, in order to be a music educator, you had to learn how to play all of the instruments, all the brass, all the woodwinds, all the uh, uh, all the string instruments, everything we had to learn how to play. So yeah. figure that out, how many that is. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. How many do you play? What instruments do you play? You could type that in the chat if you want, see if you know as many as David, I don't know. But your specialty is uh, trumpet. In fact, we're going to hear from you later in our time together. I think you could make a strong biblical case that God's excited about the trumpet. It comes into scripture quite often. So Absolutely. May you be a proclaimer of both music and the word of God. Amen. Uh, Amen. Blasting both out. But love being in a church uh, family with you through our denomination and love uh, that we're serving in this same city that we love, Chicago. Uh, we're just a little farther out here in the suburbs. But thanks for coming out and hanging out I'm with us. Glad to be so, here with you guys. Really yeah. am. Tell us more about uh, just who you are, your family, what you do. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, you heard one piece. Uh, I've been a uh, musician uh, for a large part of my life. Uh, I never thought when I first started that I would uh, continue this all the way through until I reached eighth grade and I saw that one guy playing the trumpet and I knew that's what I would do for the rest of my life. Uh, but in any case, I've been married for, I was going on 35 years now. Yeah. And uh, I have uh, three children and I have one, two, three, four grandchildren now and uh, uh, and of course I'm the uh, pastor of uh, the Church of Chicago uh, where we currently minister in uh, Oak Lawn, Illinois but we serve uh, the greater south side uh, of the city of Chicago proper. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, if I'm remembering right, you did your theological training at Dallas Seminary. Oh yeah. yeah. A little yeah. bit of time in Texas there too. Absolutely. As Sorry. a matter of fact, yeah, some of the, uh, I had a chance to learn under some of the greats like Howard Hendricks and it was really just a tremendous time. And Dwight Pentecost, those were some of my, uh, my teachers and my professors. And just had a tremendous time there and, and learned a lot. Really got really grounded in God's word there. But you're from Chicago, right? And That's now right. you're back in Chicago. And you planted that church, the, the Church of Chicago. How many years ago was that? Right. That was uh, 12 years ago, as a matter of fact. Yeah, okay. and, we, and we planted in the city of Chicago. Actually, it's not too far. Maybe about 7 to 10 minutes from our current location where we uh, currently hold services at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That must have been quite the fulfillment of a dream to have God call you back to a place where it all started for you and to be able to have a role in... Uh, you know, helping people with their life transformation right there where you're from. Absolutely. Never in a million years would I have ever thought that I would be a pastor. Uh, the fact that God would call me to be a pastor is something Amen. that's so far-fetched and I, I still marvel at the fact that here yes. I am today. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can relate to that too. So, yeah, if you had told me in high school that I'd be doing ministry, I would have never seen that coming. So, anyway. Well, uh, great. Tell, tell us more about uh, your church. Uh, God led you to plant this church several years ago. Uh, also, I might uh, add that you're on the uh, board of directors for the Great Lake District right. of our denomination. And we met each other through denominational leadership friends and sure. things like that. But uh, tell us about the uh, Church of Chicago, something about your church. Sure. Well, we are largely uh, an African-American uh, congregation. Uh, we have uh, a couple of folks from other ethnicities as well in our church, but largely African-American church. And we have served through various ways in our community. Uh, one of our main focuses is, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, our mission is to proclaim the kingdom of God with an anticipation of Christ's soon return. So any way that we possibly can, we want to get the message of the gospel out to our world. And as a matter of fact, we do that via radio. As a matter of fact, we have a website presence in which we minister to people all over the city of Chicago, some that will never, ever uh, walk through the doors of our church. Uh, but God has really blessed us to minister to people uh, with, uh, from various walks of, of life. And uh, to that end, we also have, uh, we typically have a basketball camp. As a matter of fact, it, it typically starts this week. Okay. But because of our current uh, pandemic situation, 
that we thought it not wise yeah. to uh, have a basketball camp. This is the first time in uh, 11 years that we have not had a basketball camp uh, for the community. So, yeah. oh, so those are some, some short things about uh, our church. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Def each church is definitely having to adapt, but I sense okay. that God's, you know, helping us find all the right silver linings and different ways that we can be a blessing to the people that we're trying to serve. Absolutely. Um, I think it's fun too. You say we're here to, to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's you know, it. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Absolutely. Uh, in Chicago, That's as right. it is in heaven, right. and uh, and with and what was it? An eager anticipation. With, uh, with an anticipation. An anticipation of Christ's soon return. Of Christ's soon return. Right. right. I, I think it's ironic. A, a trumpet player is uh, <laughs> saying, "Look, let's be in anticipation of Christ's soon return." You must have been reading a lot of the Book of Revelation or something. <laughs> I don't know. That's what the Lord spoke to us, and that's what we went with. Amen. Amen. That's right. You know, if, if I just lived in more anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ, I think I would be a better man, a better father, a better husband, a, be a better pastor or friend. So um, that's a good word. I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, tell us, uh, your your church is in Oak Lawn, yes. which borders Chicago. A lot of people who are watching this would say, well, I've, I've heard of Oak Lawn. Or I've gotten Oak Lawn confused with Oak Park or River Lawn Forest Park or whatever, you know, so many right. Chicago names. Tell us more about Oak Lawn. Tell us more about the south side of Chicago where you live and serve. Sure, absolutely. Well, uh, the south side of Chicago, specifically where we are at Oak Lawn, it is a very segregated area, in, in fact. Uh, Oak Lawn, uh, as a matter of fact, when I grew up, uh, it was a place in which uh, we always avoided because we knew that. Uh, if you drove through the city of Oak Lawn, that we would get stopped by the police without question. They would find some reason to stop us. And that was pretty much the testimony of every uh, African-American I knew. They, you know, my parents would say, well, we're about to go through Oak Lawn. Let's make sure that everything is together. Uh, but if we can avoid it, we'll go around there. And I've known people just get stopped, all types of things, and end up in jail uh, for really minor things. Uh, but uh, fortunately, things have changed there. And one of the things that I believe that God called us to specifically was to really to be that voice to let people know that, you know, black folks are okay in this area, right? And, uh, but the bottom line is that I think God calls us to these, uh, to these very unique relationships uh, really for his glory. And when we, uh, I think when we avoid these relationships, uh, that's where I, I think we're falling short to what God calls every single church, not just our church, but I think every single church uh, to really to be his heart, his hands, and his feet uh, throughout the world. Yeah. You know, uh, there's been so much going on in our national conversation uh, about, man, just a variety of topics in the last hundred days, all this COVID. Now we're heading into an election cycle. It seems like everybody has an opinion for us uh, or something that they want from us, you know. And then you pile on top of that um, George Floyd's death uh, six weeks ago or so now. Um, just a lot of themes for every community in America to process, but specifically in Oak Lawn. How do you feel like the people of Oak Lawn are uh, dealing with some of these themes or being impacted specifically by some of the themes that you and I have been talking about? Well, Joe, I, I think that uh, much like uh, a greater part of our country, you know, pretty much divided, uh, there's a sense that, you know, uh, you know, why are, are you folks out there doing this type of thing? Why are you guys protesting this? And we don't think it really matters uh, to that end. On the other hand, there's a good segment of, uh, of folks in Oak Lawn as well that say, yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, these things have been going on for, for many, many years. And that's uh, still that, that struggle that we have, you know, that very intense conversation that we have uh, within our community. In fact, that's also reflective, uh, I would say, uh, of the greater uh, south side of the, of, of the city of Chicago, as a matter of fact. You know, people are really struggling with, you know, how do I, uh, how do I walk through this, you know, on a practical level. Some, they, quite frankly, they avoid the conversation. They'd rather, they feel more comfortable uh, not talking about it uh, versus, you know, let's just deal with it head on. Mm -hmm. And uh, me personally, I guess this is how God has made me. I'm, I'm one of those people uh, that would say, you know what, let's just go right ahead, let's forge ahead, and let's have this really hard conversation. Because I think that by having a conversation that the, uh, the relationships really can be melded a lot better. Yeah, mm -hmm. amen. 
Amen. Uh, and then specifically within your church, you know, you've got people in your church that live in Oakland, absolutely, or in Chicago, or in other suburbs south of Oakland, absolutely. And uh, they're all, you know, coming together in unity and under Christ's name and one church family, um, and yet dealing with these uh, stressors uh, right. that are going on uh, in our community. How how is your church family feeling these days in light of COVID? In light of uh, George Floyd's death or other similar type circumstances that are uh, rightfully being talked about. Sure, uh, sure. Or just other uh, themes uh, that are playing out on the south side of Chicago. Absolutely. Yeah. So I would say, you know, much like uh, uh, the rest of the country, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic is the pandemic. I mean, what can you do? You know, it has no uh, political affiliation. It has no racial over or undertones unless we actually give it uh, some of those things. Uh, so that is what we, you know what it is. You really can't do much about that except to really try to keep ourselves safe and keep ourselves alive until this thing finally blows over, or, or until there's a vaccine or something that comes that comes about. So we're really cognizant about that. Uh, one thing uh, within the African American community, also, we're also very uh, very aware uh, of the fact that uh, a lot of folks don't have access to health care. You know, they they may not have the health plans because of. Uh, Quite frankly, they don't have the types of jobs that will give them uh, access to these doctors on a regular basis. So they kind of find out haphazardly uh, what has uh, happened in their life. They find out after the fact that they've had COVID-19. Uh, fortunately, we were very blessed that we only had uh, three people in our congregation uh, to have uh, COVID-19. Uh, and fortunately, two got really bad, but you know, we're really thankful to the Lord that they uh, turned out okay. One was a young man, happened to him, and it was over with. George Floyd is uh, a, a story that kind of plays over and over again uh, in our hearts and in our community forever. Uh, when I finally saw uh, that story, and when I actually saw the video, uh, it was devastating, and quite frankly, I avoided it. When it first came out, I, I saw one little snippet, and I'm like, no, I'll watch it later. Uh, but personally, when I watched it, I was totally devastated. And uh, yet again, uh, I was angry. You know, it's, it's very difficult to grasp how uh, uh, another human being can do that to a human being, uh, a human being uh, someone made in the image of God, without any hint of emotion, without any hint of empathy. I just, you know, I just don't get it. And much like, you know, folks that I think that have any type of uh, heart that uh, uh, they felt the same thing. Uh, but within our community, this is something, uh, this is this is a story that has been played over and over and over again. And, uh, uh, and we're just, uh, again, again, heartbroken at how uh, the systems can, uh, again, uh, do uh, uh, do this injustice to our community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, just a lot to take in there, and a, and an emotional uh, exhaustion um, that, frankly, I don't feel that I'm personally familiar with. Uh, I don't deal with some of the same dynamics that you have dealt with yeah. uh, in the neighborhood that you live in, or in the structures that you've been part of. Uh, that's right. through you know, you're also older than me. Right. as well but uh, well I, I'm sorry uh, for what's been happening and uh, I'm glad that we're able to sit down at a table and talk about it you know mm -hmm. you and I talked on the phone the, the week that George Floyd died right and to be able now to come together with some friends right and just to um, uh, I, I fear that um, there will just be news cycles that will move on to other subjects or things like that. Um, does this uh, time, this moment in time, in your lifetime, in Chicago or in other places that you've lived, does this feel distinct to you? Not really. Okay. You know, uh, maybe the distinctiveness can. Uh, I would say over the years that I've been around is that uh, maybe there is more intensity in the last few years uh, okay. that I've been around. I recall uh, even as a uh, as a child experiencing, you know, uh, the fear of going outside, uh, just afraid, uh, just being uh, six to eight years old, afraid to go outside because of the police. 
right? I, I remember that. I remember asking my parents, why can't I go outside? And they would begin to explain to me what was going on. And at that time, back in the late 60s, as a matter of fact, again, uh, our city was on fire. It was totally on fire. And they're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, and of course, they called in the military. You know, so, so when I think about you know, how, how distinct this is, I, I think it, kind of, it is really part of this long narrative. And uh, ultimately, uh, what's happening is that, you know, I, I think it's time for America really to pay the piper, uh, just in terms of uh, to deal with uh, systemic racism that's inherent uh, within our country from the very beginning. I mean, we can't avoid that. We could talk it away, uh, we could excuse it away, but at the end of the day, it's something that we have not uh, really dealt with, including, quite frankly, the church. Uh, the church uh, has been uh, one of the proponents of uh, keeping that uh, injustice alive, alive for, for over many years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, each one of us as Christians, whether it's something, uh, you know, we, we use the phrase here, near, and far. We use that at the Compass Church a fair amount. Um, there's so many subjects that are close to the heart of God, grieve the heart of God. Uh, we have to decide which of these subjects are we going to allow to come into my heart and affect me, change me. And it's so easy to feel uh, overrun. But we've got to figure out um, what is close to home, what is close to the heart of God. You know, I mean, obviously we got Jesus telling stories about the Good Samaritan who is willing to, to go there and be a difference maker and emotionally engage with pain in the way that some religious people even weren't. You know? But as we're looking at an opportunity to get close to the heart of God, I think we also have to ask ourselves, how will I use my voice? How will I use my, my actions to uh, demonstrate what is close to the heart of God? How would you encourage Christians, whether they're in Wheaton or Bolingbrook or whether they're in, in Oak Lawn or Chicago, to, to process how to activate themselves sure. around issues of race, or other issues that are close to the heart of God. Absolutely. Uh, one of the first things I would say that in, in terms of, uh, you know, what's going on in, in our nation is that absolutely this can be very exhausting. Uh, sometimes being a Christian can be exhausting. Uh, just in terms of, have you ever gone to church from week to week and uh, your preacher, he's, he's preaching or you, you, you're being taught and, and you know that God is speaking to you about one area, and then you deal with that, and you say, oh, finally, yeah, I, I got that over it, I'm good. And then you go back to church the next Sunday, and there's something else. Uh, God kind of deals with us kind of like an onion. You know, he, pu he pulls back one layer, yeah. exposes that next stinky thing, and then once he uh, has effectively dealt with that, he pulls that back, and that is part of our sanctification process. And within that sanctification process, I think this issue about race is, you know, whether you are white, whether you are black, whatever the case may, may be, I think that's part of what God really is trying to do in our life. He wants us to peel this back and really deal with it, you know, forthright. So I, I would say that uh, what the Lord really wants us to do is to enter into conversation. He wants us to engage in relationship. Uh, uh, John Perkins once told me, he says, you really, if, if you want to do something about it, you've got to have a friend. And, and, and for me, he was saying, you have to have a friend who is white, mm. right? You have to really have a deep relationship if you really want to do something about the situation. Uh, again, is it is it comfortable? Uh, initially, I would say no. Uh, uh, but I've, I've managed, you know, as, especially as a musician, I've, I've managed to have a lot of friends over the years. And where we've you know, sat down and we've practiced and we've uh, had many discussions about race, you know, you know, even now, we've just had kind of, you know, a man-to-man -man conversation about what's going on. Uh, but I think that was possible uh, solely because uh, we've had this relationship over a period of time. Yeah. Uh, now, some may say that, well, the community I live in, it, there really isn't uh, a lot of folks that way, but, you know, a lot of folks that are ethnically different than I am, uh, but surely there might be some at your church, or, uh, 
obviously don't overwhelm, you know, all, all the white folks go and, and, and smother uh, the few black folks you have at your church. You don't want to do that either. Uh, but uh, you want to make sure that you're being mindful of, of, of those individuals, whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's in your church, or what about your job? Surely there's someone that you can give a hand, you can enter into that relationship with. So I would definitely say it starts there. Uh, but the other thing I would say, you know, a lot of folks, uh, they say that they don't want to do anything until they feel more comfortable. But, uh, uh, but I believe that uh, we need to get our feet moving. And the more we get our feet moving, then our heart will follow. So sometimes our heart doesn't want to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Our heart wants to stay at home. Yeah. Quite frankly, our heart wants to stay in COVID-19 mode, mm. sheltering in place. But God says, no, you need to get, you know, put on your mask, right? And get your feet going. And then as you get your feet going, get your hands going into these relationships, you will discover that uh, there's this great man, this great woman, this great boy, this great girl that uh, is a lot like you are. Maybe, maybe different ethnically, that's very yeah. true. But the bottom line is they, they're just as human as you are. Yep. So those are my, you know, just my general, I mean, there's, so when you think of that, there's tons of things that you can do, right. you know, hey, come to our church, you know, mm -hmm. you can do that, right? You, you, you can volunteer, you can volunteer in, in a community that's, uh, that, that's hard, uh, uh, that don't have the resources that your community may have. Uh, but again, God is he, he's calling us uh, really to be his, his heart, his hands, and his feet uh, all over this world. And I think in that, when God sees that, uh, the rest of the world will see it as well. And they will know who we belong to uh, because of uh, how we respond to others. Hey, they're going to know we're Christians by our love, right? Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. You know you're saying like, uh, don't wait until conditions are perfect. Just uh, activate in some way on something is kind of what I mean. It you know, reminds me of that old musical adage of um, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, practice, 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 practice. Practice, just, right. You just got to go get started, you know. Uh, and so anyway, yeah. I appreciate that. You and I were talking the other day about um, uh, how do we use our, our voice yeah. uh, for uh, not just a common good, but for a God-honoring, Christ-honoring yes. way. Yes. And um, you know, each one of us has this, this instrument, which is our passions, which is our presence. It's, it's uh, us showing up emotionally into a relationship. You know? right. um, how do we use that instrument for um, making beautiful harmony with other people, right. you know? Right. Um, so toward that end, uh, we were thinking, hey, it might be kind of fun as we're putting a challenge before you here in just a moment uh, to, to uh, pave the way with just making an emotional connect with us through some music. Sure. Uh, I wonder if you could just take us into a little musical ditty that would inspire the soul. Sure. Uh, around how we can use this uh, for the glory of God. Absolutely. I'd yeah. love to. It just so happened I have my trumpet here with me. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we playing that. <laughs> well, here's a little something. I'm going to play a couple of notes. Um... <laughs> that we can use in connection to the things of God, the heart of God. And uh, we got to each one figure out how can we bring that to life in a way that sounds beautiful to a watching world and in a way that could bring wonderful harmony with other people. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that all of us have something special to offer, uh, not only the body of Christ, 
but to the rest of the world. And my challenge is always, what are you going to do with what God has given you? I think uh, there were ever, there would never be any perfect situation. There would never be a perfect time. Uh, I think God is calling us now. He's calling us now to serve the generation in which we are living in. And my challenge is, what are you going to do? Will you continue to have a COVID-19 heart and continue to shelter in place? Or will you really go out and uh, be what God is calling you to be? Amen. Friends, great to be here with you online. Thanks for sticking with us this whole time. And we're going to be back next week with Midweek at the Compass. Uh, just keep uh, after Christ. He wants to transform and change us. And we are privileged to be part of that journey with you. Uh, God bless you.